Welcome and thank you for being here today. I'm lovely saying your host for this webinar. I know that today's topic will bring up a number of questions from you. So you may type your questions in chat box and I want to let you know that we will address as many as we can in the time we have today. And to present today's topic, I welcome Dr. Seema Monga. Welcome, ma'am. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Namdeet. I'm Dr. Seema Munga, Associate Professor ENT in Hamdard Institute of Medical Sciences. The topic that I'm discussing today is audiology. So basically four audiological tests we are discussing. Not all the tests, but mainly four audiological tests. So audiological tests, as we all know, are objective and subjective. Right? Subjective in which we need uh, participation from the patient, although cooperation from the patient is required in all the tests, but participation required, if there is participation required, that is subjective. For example, pure tone audiometry is a subjective test, while autoacoustic emissions, impedance, and vera, these are all objective tests. All right. So basically, we are going to discuss four audiological tests. Vera, OAE, pure tone audiometry, and impedance, only four. Okay. So, first of all, what is autoacoustic emission? Autoacoustic emission, as we all know, is a very useful non invasive. It is a non invasive, it is an objective test because active participation from the child or the adult is not required. Child is sleeping, is in deep sleep, is just lying down, and we are doing the test. It is very easily repeatable and it is very fast within five to seven minutes the result can be obtained. Even non-trained people like nowadays even the ward boys and nurses if the technician is not there can easily perform if we train them. All right. So we do not need a trained audiologist or a doctor is doing only the, the machine should be fine. The ambient noise should be fine. Anyone can do it. Immediate result is obtained. Nowadays, you know that the government has made, it, has made it mandatory that every newborn before discharge from the ward has to be done. OE has to be done. Why is it so? Because we want to do early screening of congenital hearing loss. The earlier we get to know hearing loss in babies, the earlier we can start rehabilitation. You all know cochlear implantation is done. At a very early age, even at six months, people are doing, even though if you, even if you don't want to do cochlear implantation, you can start with hearing aid and speech therapy. So, OAE is very important for all newborn babies. Before discharge, OAE has to be done. So, what is the principle of OAE? We all know what is Bexy's wave. We all know this Bexy wave of traveling wave in the cochlea. So, what is tonotopicity of the auditory pathway? What does this mean? Word mean tonotopicity. Basically, the every part of the cochlea. So, basilar membrane is around 3.5 centimeters long. It is very long, 35 mm long. So, every section of the basilar membrane responds differently to different frequency. All right. Why? Because at the basal end of the cochlea, the basilar membrane is very stiff, it is tight, it is thin and stiff, while at the apex, it is wide and it is floppy. So at the basal end, the basilar membrane of the cochlea responds to high frequency, while at the apex, it responds to low frequency. So this is called tonotopicity. Different regions of basilar membrane respond differently to different frequencies. All right, this is the tonotopicity of the auditory pathway. This holds true for the entire auditory pathway. Different frequency, different response. All right, so basilar end, as I told you, it is thin and stiff. It will respond to 20,000 hertz, then 4,000, then 1,600. Then at 20 hertz, it, it will be from the low frequency response. All right, so this is basilar membrane picture. So, what is the OHC? What is basically from where autoacoustic emission is generated? From which part of the auditory pathway? It is generated from the outer hair cell. This is what you have to remember. 
it is generated from the outer hair cell. So I want you to think if OA is normal in a child or an adult, does that mean in the entire auditory pathway is normal? No, but it means that the outer hair cell are normal. All right. So how, what is the role of outer hair cell in our body? What is the role of inner hair cell? We all know it helps in hearing. All right. Regeneration of action potential and hearing. What is the role of outer hair cell? So outer hair cell acts as a cochlear amplifier. Whatever action potential, this action potential, you can see, this is the action potential. What is OHC doing? This blue mark, it is making, making the action potential taller and amplified. So outer hair cell makes it, makes the sound amplified basically. This is how you can remember. So outer hair cell act as a cochlear amplifier. So here we are checking only the outer hair cell. Basically the sound goes, there is some response generated by the outer hair cells and it is picked up by the microphone. This is what we are checking in OAE. So OAE present, the audiologist did the test with a newborn baby, OAE was present. What does it mean? It just means that cochlear amplifier is functioning and the middle ear is functioning because the sound to reach the external auditory canal, we need middle ear. Cochlear liberated, it went to the middle ear and then to the external auditory canal. So it means two things. The cochlear amplifier is normal and it means middle ear is normal. It does not mean that the entire auditory pathway, auditory nerve, superior auditory complex is normal. No, just the cochlea and the middle ear. So it is the biological phenomenon generated in a normal cochlea when cochlea processes an incoming auditory impulse. We are giving a sound. What uh, biological phenomena is generated in the cochlea? It is OAE. This is the mechanical activity that takes place in the outer hair cell of the cochlea before the inner hair cells are stimulated. There are no action potentials. We are not measuring electrical activity. We are only measuring the sound. That is why it is measured by the microphones. It is not recorded by electrodes like in Vera we use electrodes, in OAE we are using the microphones. So what is the procedure? The tightly fit probe, the only important part you should know, that you need to remember is whenever you're putting the probe, it should be tightly fitting. It should not be loose and just lying down and floppy, no. It has to be tightly fitting so that whatever faint noise outer hair cells have generated, it will be picked up by the microphone. The child should be sleeping, preferably sleeping. If the child is four to five years of age, he, he can sit quietly with his eyes closed, that is fine. But better is the child should be sleeping. And the question comes if the child is crying and moving around, can we do OAE? No, we cannot. Okay, he should be quiet, he should be sleeping, even same for adults. Try to be quiet, try to sleep, try to not move, try to not swallow. And what should we do? Do we require a soundproof room for OAE? Is the next question. No, we do not require a soundproof auditory room. It can be done in the ward with the side of the mother, but there should not be extra noise like a fan which is making noise or a motor is there or AC is making noise. Try to switch off all these gadgets so that there is no extra noise. So what is the level of the noise in the ambient environment for OE? It should be less than 35 dB. So this is how a test result is interpreted. Acoustic stimulus, what is acoustic stimulus? I just told you the stimulus that is given. What is ambient noise? Ambient noise is also known as the noise floor. That is noise in the environment. We call it noise floor. Then we measure signal to noise ratio. What is signal? What we received. Noise is noise. It should not be more than six. If signal to noise ratio, that is what we received, is higher than the noise by more than six, that means result is pass. We inter hum jo result batate, how do we tell? Pass, prefer, or doubtful. So pass is if signal to noise ratio is more than six. This is how we interpret it. This is a tick mark is given. It says clear response, pass. And what is this green thing? Green is the acoustic stimulus. Black is the noise. What are these two, three, four, five? These are frequencies. At 2000 words, we are not measuring. In this case, 
3000, we are measuring 4000, 5000 kilohertz. So signal to noise ratio is more than six, all right? Here it is more than six, so it is pass. Now, what are the types of OE? Types of OE basically are spontaneous, three types. So spontaneous, distortion product, transient evoked. What is spontaneous? Spontaneous, that is, we did not give any stimulus. We just, the patient, we are, uh, the patient is sleeping or sitting. They did not give any stimulus. They, but spontaneously, our outer hair cells normally producing certain OE. That is spontaneous OE. We do not measure for practical purposes. It has no significance because it is present in only 50% of cochlea. So spontaneous OE, no significance here, just for theory. So there are two types of OE that we measure, distortion product or transient evoked. Spontaneous OE is present in 40 to 70 percent of people. TE OE is present. TE OE is, what is TE OE? TE OE is transient evoked autoacoustic emission. Transient, what do you mean by the word transient? That is, there is an interval. Transient means interval. There is an interval between stimulus given and OE received. That is transient, there is an interval. DPOE, there is no interval. What is DP is distortional product. Distortional product means we give two frequencies, different frequency. In transit, we are giving only one frequency. In DPOE, we have two speakers in the probe, two frequencies are given, and whatever the distortion product is obtained is measured. So it is distortion product. You can measure in a baby TP, TEOE also and DPOE also, that is fine, but just for understanding, there are two types. So in transient, uh, one tone is given. In DPOE, two frequencies are given. Two PO tones are presented together. There is some interaction. There is some distortion. And this leads to generation of new frequency sounds. So this is how a TEOE looks like. This is just an example. In a newborn, 30 decibel TEOE. In a 30 decibel uh, uh, noise, it is obtained in a young child. And it is an artist. How it, this picture looks. This looks like this wave. All right. So it can be click or tone evoked. What is tone? We say pure tone, pure tone, and say click. So pure tone means single frequency sound of single frequency. Click can be multiple frequencies. So click is more popular, but tone can be used. Intensity of responses is around the intensity of uh, not the stimulus that we, intensity of the response that we are receiving. It is around 20 to 30 decibels in children. That stimulus that have been received here, that is around 20 to 30 decibel. Generally, it is present in all with hearing level. Generally, it is present in all with hearing level less than uh, hearing level than 20, better than 20 decibel. When two pure tone presented together, there is some interaction of their traveling wave on the base of the membrane, leads to generation of several new sounds. This is distortion product. This is our DPOA looks like this is a DPOE. So we have F1, one frequency. We have F2, second frequency. All right. So two frequencies are being given. Two frequency sounds are being given. And what is generated is distortional. This is DP1. This is generated. So we are concerned with this. The frequency of interest is 2F1 minus F2. This is the distortion product. This is the formula. You don't need to rememorize these formulas. What you need to understand is this is where we focus. So F2 or F1 ratio, okay. So this is a, again a picture in certain uh, machines. This is how it looks like, the result looks like. This is a DP gram. What is a DP gram? Basically, at different frequencies, if we plot the result, it is called DP gram. 2,000 hertz, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. This is how it looks like. This green is the signal to noise ratio. Now you can see at every frequency, 2, 3, 4, 5, how much is the signal to noise ratio? It is more than six, all right? Here it is around 15, here it is around 30. So it has to be more than six to be pass. This is what you have to remember. So this is the patient left ear pass. Again in right ear, it is more than six, more than six. So it is also pass. Okay, so this is how again a DPOE F1, this is two frequency F2, F1, DP. And this is second F2 minus F1. This is the frequency where we are concerned. So this is how our DP grams looks like. 
So what is a DP gram? Basically, many frequencies. We were talking that DPO is about two frequency, but in a DP gram, we can check many frequencies and then obtain the distortion product of all these frequencies. Do we need to do so many uh, frequency tests? Only significances when we are checking ototoxic drugs like amikacin. Then we can plot a DP gram. Where we can know exactly which frequency hearing loss is there. All right, DPO is present, but abnormal noise floor. Okay, so DPO is present when six decibel decide. So interpretation is basically pass, refer, pass is 20 decibel or better, or refer is when the hearing loss is 40 decibels worse, or refer or pass, it can be doubtful basically when hearing is of 25 to 35 decibel. So hearing is almost normal, it will be pass. It is worse than 40 decibel, it will refer. Or if it is 25 to 35, it will be in between. But the question is, suppose you go to ward, you will see this OE result, it says refer. Do you tell the mother that the child is having hearing loss or it is deaf? Do you do that? No. So the guidelines are, if you see that the it is refer, you check the ear, maybe there is wax, maybe there is fluid, maybe the probe is not properly fitted. Okay, even if there is a, all these things are fine, maybe there is no otitis media with effusion or nothing. You repeat the test after a week or after two weeks. You give medication for otitis media with effusion, maybe there is fluid, all right? And then repeat after two weeks. This is the guideline. So, OAE absent does not mean that the child is deaf. You straight away refer the child for speech therapy, cochlear implant. No. Repeat the test. So, first thing I forgot to tell you. First thing before any audiological test, always examine baby's ear. Always examine. Maybe there is wax and you are trying to snugly fit the probe. It won't fit. Maybe there is a congenital normality. The probe is not getting fitted. It is floppy. Or there is fluid. Otitis media with effusion. OE result won't be fine, won't be uh, correct. So what are the drawbacks? Drawbacks is that it can only suggest hearing loss. It is only a screening test. It is not a confirmatory test. So it is used only for screening. Main use of OE nowadays is for screening of newborn babies. You cannot distinguish between mild, moderate, and severe. It can only suggest that there is hearing loss. You don't know whether it is retrocochlear, what is it? So normal OE does not mean normal hearing. Example, if the deafness, suppose there is sensory neural hearing loss because of the inner hair cells in the auditory nerve or higher auditory pathway, like there's multiple sclerosis. So central disorder is there, but OE will be normal, all right? Or the child has auditory neuropathy, OE will be normal. Why? Because we do not need the nerve to check OE. We are only checking till the cochlea. We're coming back again. The sound is going to cochlea, coming back again. You don't need the auditory pathway. All right. So this is the drawback of OAE. So OAE present, you cannot tell the mother that your child is perfectly fine. Okay, there is no sensorial hearing loss. All right. So if absent, you perform other tests, yes. So the guidelines are if after repeated, even if you've repeated after two, three times, after a, after a time gap, OA is absent. What do you do now? Now you do VERA to confirm the hearing loss or you do panometry, acoustic reflex, these battery of tests you will do. So these are the uses. Yes, for theory, you have to remember malingering can also be done. So uh, hearing, does, Structural function integrity of cochlea by DP gram. Again, I just told you uh, to check the result of ototoxic drug. Okay, so next, this is uh, again a subjective test. OE was an objective test. Pure tone, what is the difference between pure tone? Pure tone, I told you, is a sound of single frequencies. Complex sound, that the sound we are talking, we are hearing, is a complex sound. It has many frequencies, multiple frequencies. Pure tone is a single sound that is given by the audiometer. So audiometer, there are many types of audiometer that we use, but generally for practical purposes, we use these frequencies, 125, 250, then 500, 1000, 1500, and 
till 8000 hertz. New audio meter even use higher frequencies, but this is the main general frequency that we're using. The tone, what is the intensity of the tone? It can be amplified up to 110 decibel. There is an attenuator dial that can be used. So this is, where is the pure tone audiometry done? It is done in a soundproof room, right? It is done in a soundproof room. The sound pressure level should be less than 25, 26 decibel. The sound in the, the noise in the room, right? It is a soundproof room. This is the uh, technician that is sitting here and this is the patient, all right? So first of all, what do you do before doing audiometry again? You have to check many things. There is a checklist before doing audiometry. You check your instrument, whether it has been calibrated or not, all right? You check whether it is working or not. You check the sound in the audiometry room and you examine the ear, all right? Whether there is wax, all right? Whether it has a titus, a patient has a titus externa, you're trying to fit the probe but will cause pain because he has a titus externa, whether there is perforation first. So, first of all, examine the ear. Now, what do you tell the patient? Straight away, he'll come, you put the uh, microphone and then start the test? No. You have to explain the procedure. All right. Why? Because it is not easy. That tone that is given by the audiometer is not like a complex. It's not like a normal noise. It's not like a normal sound. You have to familiarize him with the tone. How do you familiarize him? Mask, make him put the earphone and tell him this is the kind of sound that you'll hear. Make him hear. And then tell him whichever side you hear, raise that hand. Suppose you hear right side, you raise that hand. You hear left side, you will raise left hand. And then what are the instructions that you give? That, that your active cooperation is important, but you do not try to threaten the patient that you have to respond. No, then he responds on every time. All right. So this is what is important. And you have to tell him, do not try to uh, move around during the test. This is important. So what are the uses? We all know Pivotone audiometry uses. So to detect the hearing loss, to check conductive, sensory neural, mixed hearing loss loss and what is the degree of hearing loss so before doing pt i told you calibration of regular calibration of the audiometer should be done it should be a noiseless environment position of headphone is very important it should not be loosely fitting like it is hanging the ear is not covered properly so position of headphone is very important where do you have to keep it? There are supraoral headphones. We have many kinds of headphones. We have supraoral, we have circumoral, we have insert headphone, whatever headphones you're using. These are commonly used, but it should be properly fitted. Then bone conduction vibrator should be properly kept. It should not be put on the hairy area. It should be on the mastoid bone, right? Because mastoid bone is very sensitive to the bone conduction vibrator. Some people even say that forehead can be used, but for all practical purposes, we use the mastoid bone. And then I just told you what instruction to the patient you have to give. So how do you check the, how do you do pure tone audiometry? So first of all, start with the better ear. Why? Because he can now, if you start with the poor ear, he won't understand as it is what sound are you giving. So start with the better ear. How will you know what is the better ear? By general conversation. This is what the, I'm talking about in audiology. Suppose you are doing the test. Start conversing with the patient. You'll get to know which is the better ear. Start with the better ear and start with 1000 hertz because it is the, at, at that frequency, it is very sensitive. You can easily hear. Then you go to 2000 and 4000, 8000, 10,000. Then you again come back to 1000 and then you go to 500 and 250. So first thing is familiarize the patient by a supra threshold. What is a supra threshold? You will get to know approximately by conversation. How much is this threshold? It is 60, it is 40. Suppose by conversation, you get to know it is around 40 to 50 decibel. So familiarize the patient by that sound by giving a supra threshold level. The technique that you have to remember is five up, 10 down. That means suppose you get to know, suppose by talking to the patient, you think that this patient has 50 decibel around, this must be 50 to 60 decibel threshold. What you do now is you give him 70 decibel sound, all right? 70 decibel air, we are talking about air conduction. You give him 70 decibel sound. Patient says, yes, I can hear. What you do now, suppose he can hear, you re reduce it by 10 decibels. This is 10 decibel down. 
So how much is it now? 60 decimal. He again says I can hear it now. So again reduce it by 10 decimal. It is how much? 50. Now the patient says I can't hear. What do you say now? Now you will improve, you will increase the noise by 5 decibel. So how much now? 55. Now he says I can hear. So after three times repeating, he can hear at 55 decibel. So that is your threshold at that particular frequency. So this is 5 up, 10 down technique. So three out of five responses are obtained. That is your threshold. So there is, that is the technique that we normally use. There is one more technique just for theory. That is the ASHA technique. Here, you start in every patient, you start with 30 decibel. Suppose you give 30 decibel sound and he says, I can hear. All right. Now you lower the sound by 10 decibel. All right. Or if he says, I can't hear. In normal situation, you would have raised by 10, but in ASHA technique, you raise it by 20. After that, it is safe. All right. This is the ASHA technique. So that was the air conduction that I'm talking about. What is the, how do we check the bone conduction? First of all, we all know the theory behind bone conduction. How do we hear when a bone conduction is done? In a bone conduction, when we vibrate the mastoid, how do we, there are three pathways by which it goes inside the cochlea. When you're vibrating the mastoid, the sound will go through three pathways, all right? First is the compressional distortion bone conduction. That means the sound is going to the cochlea, and inside the fluids are having this compression and distortion bone conduction effect. Second is the inertial bone conduction. What is that? That uh, skull is vibrated, everything is vibrated, but the ossicles are not vibrating because of the inertia. So this phase differential we need to sound. So that is inertial bone conduction. Third is you vibrated the skull. This vibration leads to vibration of the air inside the external auditory canal. This ear air is vibrating, this air vibration lead to the panic membrane vibration, ossicles vibration, and the cochlear vibration. So this is the osseo-tympanic bone conduction from the pastoid bone to the air in the canal, then tympanic membrane, then middle ear, then cochlear. So three pathways, all right? Directly through the cochlea, through the external artery canal, all right? And through the inertia. So uh, again, technique is the same like air conduction, five up, 10 down. What are the problems that we face in bone conduction? Air conduction is simple, not simple, but bone conduction has more problems than air conduction. Many problems. For example, skull thickness is different in different people. In some patients, it is very thick. In some patients, it is thin. Some patients, the skin is thick. So, second is the vibrotactile stimulation. What is vibrotactile? At low frequencies, around 250 to 500 hertz, what happens is the vibrations. The ear canal is the bone is vibrating and the patient thinks that this is the sound so it is not actually the sound it is the vibration at lower frequency then what do we have the bone what is the masking so bone conduction vibrator the biggest problem with bone conduction is that whenever you're vibrating whenever you are uh, giving the stimulus of the one cock to the one cochlea through bone conduction the second cochlea is also getting stimulated simultaneously, exact same sound. So you're stimulating this cochlea, exact level of intensity is uh, of this cochlea is getting stimulated. So this is the main problem with bone conduction vibrator. While in air conduction, you give sound here, some sound will go to the this here, but not full sound. Why? Because of the interoral attenuation. What is interoral attenuation? You're stimulating, you're giving sound to a, through air conduction in this ear, the cochlea is getting stimulated, but some vibrations will go to cochlea of this ear. Why some? Because there is such big skull, brain, a lot of organs inside, so it will get attenuated, get reduced while going to the cochlea of the other ear. Normally, this reduction is around 40 to 50 decibels. So interoral attenuation, interoral means between this to this, it is around 40 decibel. While in bone conduction, exact sound from this to this is going. So this is what I'm doing. So basically this is the test here, all right? This is the test here. You're giving 70 decibel to this ear, but here, non-test ear around 25 decibel sound is going. This is air conduction I'm talking about, all right? We are giving 70 decibel, 
25 decibel is this ear, this ear can also hear. And in bone conduction, you're giving this is the test ear, 30 decibel bone conduction sound is here, but in this ear also 30 decibel is going. So this both ears can hear same quantity of noise. So masking and masking, this is blocked. You want to test this ear, you don't want this ear to hear. Just you mask this ear. This is masking, right? You do with a masking headphone. If you're testing right ear, you do not want left ear to hear. So you mask in both in air conduction and bone conduction. You want to mask the left ear. So internal attenuation, we I just told you. So when to do masking is the question. How much to do masking is also a question. And when to do? Should we do in every case masking? Yes. In every time you are checking the bone conduction, do masking. Why? I just told you because exact same noise is going. So every time you do bone conduction, check your audiologist that he is doing masking or not. Whereas in air conduction, you only do masking when you are using sounds of 45 decibel or more because I just told you because of the interaural attenuation. Suppose the threshold of air conduction is only 30 decibel. Now you don't need to do, you know, you don't need to mask this here because 45 decibel to reduce over here. 45 decibel after getting reduced, no sound is going in this here. So masking is done in air conduction only when we are using 45 decibel or more. Okay. So these are the formulas. How much to mask? So you don't, you just uh, need to know how much is, uh, should be, these, how to calculate basically. So minimum masking and maximum masking. So minimum masking is the minimum amount of sound that is required to mask one ear. So this is the bone conduction of the test ear plus AM minus, what is AM? Mast ear. All right, this is BT is the test ear bone conduction. Suppose you are testing the right ear and the bone conduction threshold is around 30. For bone conduction, minimum masking is 30 plus air conduction of the left ear minus bone conduction of the left ear. Similarly, this is the air for air conduction. This is the formula. Now, why maximum masking? Why not give a lot of sound? Why not give 90 decibel sound? You're checking right ear. Why not give 90 decibel loud sound to left ear? So so that it does not hear at all. Why? Because again, you, how are you giving masking by air conduction? Suppose 90 decibel air conduction you are giving here. How much will go here? Around 50 decibel will go here. It will again mask this left ear also. We don't mask left ear, uh, right ear to be masked. We are checking this here. So do not over mask it. All right. So this is Hood's plateau method for masking. So these are the symbols you all know. What are the symbols for masking? You all know the symbols for masking. Uh, this is air conduction. Cross is used and then circle is used. If we are masking, we use this rectangle and triangle. For bone conduction, we use this. So whenever you get an audiology report in your hand, always check whether your audiologist has done masking or not. All right. If these symbols are used, that means he has done masking. So everyone, please look at this audiogram. What is the problem in this audiogram? The theory that I just told you. So right ear is absolutely normal. But do you see the masking symbols here? No. There is no masking symbols in the right ear. All right. So this is one mistake. Here also no masking symbols in ear conduction. Okay. So this is right ear. Now check the left ear. Left ear shows conductive hearing loss, all right, because there is an AB gap. But again, no masking is used. So what is the problem? Right ear is fine. Eventually, after masking, what we notice is right ear result was fine. But left ear, this bone conduction threshold is not the true bone conduction threshold of left ear. Right. This actually is not the left ear bone conduction threshold. This was the right ear that was hearing because there was no masking used. When we presented, the patient had sensory neural hearing loss in left ear. But suppose we gave 20 decibel sound, right ear was hearing. So this is the shadow curve of the left ear. This is the shadow curve. Shadow means right ear ka shadow. This is shadow of the right ear. Exact same, like the right ear slightly lower. This is the shadow. We are checking the left ear, but what we obtained is the shadow of the right ear. So after correct masking, 
this was the result. So do you see left ear actually had sensory neural hearing loss, All right? So this is very important mistake that is done. Conductive hearing loss, patient has conductive, patient has sensory neural hearing loss, but what we received is conductive hearing loss. So whenever you see this kind of picture, ask your audiologist to do masking, right? Here, air conduction also masking was done again, and it was also found to be a little lower. So interpretation, we all know what is mixed deafness, what is conductive deafness, what is sensory neural, all right? We all know these things. And we all know how do we uh, say that the patient has this much handicap, that the patient has mild hearing loss or moderate deafness, severe deafness. Can anyone tell me what exactly, what are we actually measuring? We are saying 0 to 25 decibel normal. We are saying 26 to 40 decibel mild. What is this 26 to 40 bone conduction, air conduction or the AB gap? So this is actually the air conduction average threshold, right? This is how we say mild, moderate, severe. This is the air conduction threshold, which is the average. We obtain three frequencies and we take out the average. And this is how we calculate the deafness. This is the air conduction threshold. So this is an audiogram of a normal patient, right? You can see very well. In bone conduction, masking was done, but not in ear conduction. Why? Because we don't need to use more than 45 decibel here. It is not getting used. This is normal on it now. So this is mild conductive hearing loss, right? We are checking the ear conduction threshold, right? Mild hearing loss, 25 to 40 dB, mild hearing loss. Moderate degree of sensory neural hearing loss. We are using masking here. Right. Again, this is very severe mixed hearing. We know how this is mixed because there is an AB gap also and the bone conduction threshold is also low. This is mixed hearing loss. This is a very high AB gap. This is usually seen in which cases. Such high AB gap around 60 decibel. It is seen in ossicular discontinuity. These are typical audiogram, but sometimes typical audiogram is also not seen. What is this? Is this what is this again? A typical picture of autosclerosis 2000 hertz, Kahart's notch. All right, we all know this is Kahart's notch. Two, at 2000 hertz, there is a dip. This is a Kahart's notch autosclerosis patient. This is a flat audiogram. All right, when do we call it flat? When it is not increasing in every frequency. All right, the increase is not much. It is almost safe. It is flat audiogram. It is seen in which patients again, typical of. Trial press by QSIS. This is a descending audiogram, all right? Acoustic trauma. This is a patient where 4000 hertz, we see at 4000 hertz, there is a dip. This is a typical picture of acoustic trauma. This is a rising audiogram. Trough shape audiogram. Where is it seen? Trough shape audiogram. Classical of congenital hearing loss, all right? Again, uh, these are all typical pictures, but sometimes they cannot, they, they cannot be seen. These are vibrotactile artifacts that I've just told you about. 250 to 500 hertz low frequency. These are actually not the threshold, but these are the only the vibrations. So next test, objective test that we are discussing is the impedance audiometry, right? This is the impedance audiometry. What do you mean by the term impedance? So, impedance is a function of three, basically three parameters, mass, stiffness, and friction, all right? Impedance is the function of three parameters, mass, parameters inside the ear, mass, stiffness, and the friction. So, impedance audiometry, this is a basic principle of impedance audiometry machine. We have a microphone. What does a microphone do, basically? that whatever sound we are receiving, it is picking up. Then we have a phone that gives the sound. And then we have this probe, airtight probe, through which these three apertures are there. For one for the sound, one to picking up the sound, the microphone, and third one to change the pressure inside the 
middle ear inside the external auditory canal. So what frequency of what tone are we giving? We are giving 226 hertz tone. In impedance, we are giving only 226 hertz tone. This is a manometer through which the pump pressure is changed. So we can do minus negative middle ear pressure or we can make it positive middle ear pressure also. We are, we are changing the pressure inside the middle ear through this pump. And then we check at which pressure the middle ear is functioning the best. The tympanic membrane is functioning the best. We are changing the pressure in the external canal and the middle ear, and then we are checking at which level, at which level the compliance is the maximum. So this is what we are doing. We are giving the pressure and then we are checking. So basically, what is the principle? We have air inside the middle ear, whereas in cochlea there is fluid. So air has low impedance, whereas cochlear fluid has high impedance. So middle ear, what is the function of the middle ear? Function of the middle ear is to act as a impedance matching device. There is sound traveling through the middle ear, air and cochlear fluid. So ideally, if there is no middle ear, there has, in, because of the impedance, less of sound will be heard. But because of the middle ear matching mechanism, the impedance is uh, equalized. So what is the middle ear pressure? We know what is the compliance? Compliance is the ease of movement, basically. It is the ease of movement through which the tympanic membrane is vibrating. It is the reciprocal of the stiffness. So actually, we are not measuring the stiffness. We are measuring the compliance in the impedance audiometry. So what are the uses? We all know the uses to check the middle ear pressure, to check whether it is cochlear or retrocochlear, to check the site of lesion through stapedial reflex, we can check what is the site of lesion in facial palsy and brainstem pathology. So this is the procedure I just told you about. This is the probe and we have three apertures. Through one, we are giving the frequency noise. Through one, we are checking the pressure. And through third, we are checking what is the sound that is coming out. Okay. So this is a manually plotted tympanogram. These days, we don't need to plot it manually. It is automatically coming. So there are many things that we need to check. Whenever you uh, get a tympanometry report in your hand, you have to check few things. First, what scale is being used? So here, 2.5 ml scale is being used. There are two kinds of scales that are being used, 2.5 ml or 5 ml. Here, 2.5 ml is being used. Then you have to check what is the shape of the tympanogram. Right? Then you have to check what is the volume at 200 millimeters pressure. This is 200 millimeters of pressure. This is the volume around C1. So in manually plotted, C1 is the external auditory canal volume. This is the manually plotted the panogram. And then how much is the middle ear? How much is the compliance at zero? That is the middle ear pressure. How much is the compliance? It is C2. So this is the compliance. So static compliance in a manually plotted tympanogram is C2 minus C1, that is 1.35 minus 0.75, which is 0 0.6. This is the static compliance, but this is only a manually plotted. These days we get automatically plotted tympanogram like this. How do we interpret? You will get this kind of report in your hand. So you will check the compliance. It is written here. This is the volume. This is the compliance. This is the pressure, middle ear pressure, and this is the gradient. And along with uh, the panometry, you usually get a uh, stapedial reflex report also. So how much is the compliance here? So what is the report here? What is the result? In both the years, it is normal. In both the years, it is normal. Even the EPSI contra reflexes are normal. So this is a normal report, right? So not, what are the normal values you have to memorize? So normal compliance value is 0.35 to 1.4. Normal middle ear pressure in adults is plus 50 to minus 50. So if in a child it comes out to be minus 90, it is normal. All right. But if in an adult it comes out to be minus 100, minus 120, it is abnormal. So in adults, plus 50 to minus, minus 50. In young children, it is plus 25 to minus 100. 
So again, this is a normal tympanogram. You can see how much is the compliance here? 1.19. Here it is 1.39. I told you between 0.35 to 1.5 to 1.4 can be normal. So it is almost normal. Shape is fine. Middle ear pressure is fine. Minus 18. Slightly here, it is coming at the peak. Minus 18 here. Minus 17 here. The shape is fine. It is A-shaped. You know, shape is fine. So it is normal. Contra, ipsi, lat, this ipsi and contralateral reflexes, stapedial reflexes are fine. So this is a normal ear. So compliance, you can see 1.39, right? So what this you have to memorize, there are many pathologies which lead to decreased compliance. So basically, when will the compliance decrease? So compliance is the ease of movement. It will decrease when the ear will become stiff. What are the conditions that leads to increased stiffness like? Otosclerosis, fixed malleus syndrome, a tympanic membrane has become very stiff because of tympanosclerosis or adhesive otitis media. Again, the compliance will be reduced. Or there is a lot of fluid inside the ear, compliance will reduce. So in normal, in certain cases of otosclerosis, compliance can be normal. So sometimes you check a report that patient, you see a report of otosclerosis, Stapedial reflex is absent, but compliance is normal. So in certain cases, it can happen. Normal compliance is present in obstetrion, station to obstruction without secretory changes. And then the compliance increases when the ease of movement is high, like in ossicular chain discontinuity, or there is a perforation, it will become very high. Now, this is a, a tricky case. This is a bilateral autosclerosis. Now you can see, Right here, how much is the compliance? It is very high, 1.9. But stapedial reflexes are absent. So typical of autosclerosis. But why is the compliance so high? So, so this was the case of post stapy surgery. So we did stapedectomy and we put a piston. But after about a sneezing, piston slipped away. So it is a kind of ossicular discontinuity. That that's why the is high. All right, here again it is autosclerosis, but why is the compliance normal? It has become stiffened because ideally it should reduce, but in certain cases of autosclerosis, compliance is still normal. Okay. So, middle ear pressure, this again you have to memorize normal middle ear pressure, negative middle ear pressure, you all know, blocked a station tube, and there is no peak that is flat. All right, there is no peak in adhesive otitis media, or perforation, or there is a grommet, right? So shape and type of, in short of time, type and shape of tympanogram is important. This is a notched tympanogram. Again, ossicular discontinuity can be obtained. So what are the fallacies basically? Always examine the ear, all right? Suppose there is a perforation and there is an autosclerosis. Now you're checking, so it will become wrong. So Maybe there is autosclerosis and again station tube blockage. So again, the result will be different. All right. Low middle ear pressure, but low compliance. Okay. So this is wide band tympanometry. Like I just told you, normally we are using one or two frequencies, but in wide band tympanogram, we are using many frequencies. This is the latest thing actually. So with tympanometry, we can check these three uh, functions. This is the William test. Basically, we are checking the station tube function now with uh, demonometry. We ask the patient to swallow and we ask the patient to do Valsalva. In all three cases, it is normal. So, station tube is normal. This is William's test when the tympanic membrane is intact. This is Toynbee's test when the, there is a perforation. After repeated swallows, after repeated swallows, first thing is we gave plus 300 middle ear pressure. We asked the patient to swallow five times. And ideally, if the station tube is normal, it should come down to normal. The middle ear pressure should be normal. This is normal tympanogram. This is a stapedial reflex. What is the function? We all know when loud sound is given, what will happen? Because of the uh, intraauricular muscle, stapedial and tensor tympani, the tympanic membrane will become stiff. That is the principle. This is the pathway of so this is the pathway of acoustic reflex. The important part to remember is we gave sound to one ear, 
but both sides tibial reflex will be stimulated that is the important part to remember so uses we all know what do we do how do we what are the uses to check the middle ear disorder to check sensory hearing loss to check the cochlear nucleus so how do we interpret so basically if the acoustic reflex is present there is absence of any pathology in the reflex pathway so acoustic reflex present that means it is almost normal but if it is absent it does not mean that the patient has hearing loss okay so it is a very sensitive parameter even if there is no conductive deafness even with slightest midway pathology acoustic reflex might be absent but again it does not mean that there is hearing loss so the third and the most popular objective is the bear up you all know why why do we use it we use it difficult to test patients like in infants and mentally retarded people or in malingering we have to check this are these are the electrodes that we are putting so mainly used in children to see the hearing loss to confirm the hearing loss these are the three electrodes that we used so important part to remember is that we are checking in the first 10 milliseconds we are giving the sound so many uh, waves are being produced in many milliseconds what we are doing in there is the first 10 milliseconds are being used right so this is the pathway you what you have to understand is after the superior olivary complex it is bilateral all right both the sides are getting stimulated why because superior olivary complex it is bilateral so cochlear nucleus is stimulating superior olivary complex of both the sides okay so waves this is what you have to remember in a bera first five waves are the important part to remember so one and two are because of the cochlear nerve three is because of the cochlear nucleus and superior olivary complex lateral lemniscus contribute to four and five so what are the conditions again the patient should be preferably sleeping relaxed not talking not swallowing child has to be sedated otherwise it won't be correct how do you interpret it you interpret the one two three latency this is how you interpret the latency between one wave and three wave should be less than two right or less than 2.4 if it's more than 2.4 it is high. the latency between one to five should not be more than 4.4 and between one year and other year there should not be difference of more than 0.3 so what is this picture you can you see that this is vera of patient this patient had acoustic neuroma on the right side all right right side acoustic neuroma how did you check you check the latency between one to three on the right side it is written in the report it is written all you have to do is just check the report between one to three how much is the latency 2.65 i told you it should not be more than 2 or 2.2 it is very high so it is a patient of acoustic neuroma on the right side here how much is the latency 2.1 2.2 it is normal here it is 2.6 now, this is bilateral acoustic neuroma, all right? Both the sides acoustic neuroma. On the right side, do you see any wave? No wave. On the left side, there are waves, one, two, three, but again, not very good, not very high amplitude. On the left, on the right, there is no wave. You're sure there is acoustic neuroma. But on the left side, here also, 2.9. How much is the latency I told you should be less than 2.2? It is high. One to three is high, and three to five is also high, okay? This is a 19 month old child with speech delay. Okay, now can you tell me why is this child having speech delay? Although even to 30 decibel of noise, there are waves. So what you have to see is what is the last threshold where waves are present? Even at 30 decibel, you can see such a low sound. You can still see one, two, three, five. So definitely the hearing loss, the speech delay is not due to hearing loss. In both the years, 30 decibel, there are waves. Okay. So the result, the finally, after testing, this child was found out to be autistic. So this is the function of bearer. So again, a three-year-old child, no speech. Here, yes. And even at 100 decibel of sound, there are no waves. Okay. So you have to check how much sound are you giving and how much, and are you getting the waves. So most important wave is the wave five, basically. Try to uh, identify wave 5 first, all right? If you identify wave 5 first, it will be easier. So, 
Any questions, anyone? Thank you, Dr. Seema. I can uh, only see one question. Which frequencies average is used to describe hearing loss? Okay. So, as I told you, whenever there is mild, moderate, severe, you do not check the bone conduction threshold. You do not check the air conduction threshold. You only check the air conduction threshold at three average frequencies. Mostly 1000, 1500 and 2000. These three are the most common frequencies that we use. So, take out the average of these three frequency and then you calculate the hearing loss. I can open the chart somehow. Any other questions, sir, that you can read because I can't open the chart. Yeah, I think no more questions, Dr. Seema. Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation. Welcome, Dr. Nilima. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Navneet. Uh, thank you so much, Seema. It was an excellent, lucid presentation. And uh, so many things which are uh, uh, not clear often about masking and about the impedance. And uh, you made it very uh, clear with your uh, lucid uh, presentation. Uh, we can't see the questions, but yeah, Mr. Navneet, you saying you, there are no more questions, I think. Oh, they started coming. <laughs> okay. So maybe uh, we can take one or two more questions. We have time. Seema, just, just check at the left bottom. There is an option of chat box if you can open. There is no question in this. Chat box. It is only your message. Good day. That's it. Can you see the questions, Dr. Uh, Seema? I think there is one question that if both uh, OE and Bera are normal, how to assess after that? I think there is one. This question is there. So, if both OE Bera are normal, you can obviously, if it is adult, you can do speech audiometry. So, one thing important to remember is that pure tone audiometry and speech audiometry are actually testing your hearing. So, hearing means understanding of what your sound you are getting. While in OE Bera, you're just getting the sound, and your ear and brain are functioning. While in speech audiometry and pure tone audiometry, you're actually understanding, like suppose you give a sound to a mother of a, uh, that the baby is crying. So that shows that the mother is understanding that the baby is crying. All right, that kind of thing I'm telling. So if they are abnormal, you can check the pure tone audiometry and the speech audiometry. All right. All right. Although if both of them are absent, like Vera also shows hearing loss, OE also shows hearing loss, that is suggestive that the patient has hearing loss. Because Vera is highly sensitive test, basically. The next question is, how will be the audiological findings in AMSD, ma'am? I didn't get the question. How will be the audiological findings in ANSD, ma'am? ANSD? Yes. Can you just please spell it out for me? ANSD. Dr. Aruna asked this question. I can't. Dr. Aruna, please clarify the question. Mr. Navneet, the audio is breaking. Uh, Dr. Anu, you may unmute and ask a question. I'm auditory neuropathy spectrum disorder, ma'am. 
how will we find out with the audiological findings ma'am yes so in bera there will be disorders like it is a central disorder so latency between 3 to 5 might increase in that cases all right so it is a central disorder no auditory neuropathy uh, spectrum disorder these are all centrally so bera you can check bera but in, even in certain bera cases it will be not like pure tone audiometry might not show any result oe might not show but bera can tell you so you can uh, do bera in certain in these cases okay ma'am thank you ma'am Yogesh, you may unmute and ask your question. Uh, Dr. Simon, the next question is how to calculate average speed, uh, speech, speed average if one of frequency is not recorded. How to calculate the speech average? So speech audiometry I'll be taking in another uh, lecture. Only four uh, audiological tests I've covered here. Speech audiometry will be covered in another lecture. And how to interpret DNA from HL from Vera? How to? How to interpret DNA of HL from Vera? How to implement? I didn't get it. How to interpret? How to interpret? Yes. So. So, the, uh, like I just showed you in the picture, suppose even at 30 decibel, you're getting all the waves. So, approximate threshold is 10 decibel lower than that. So, for correct, correct uh, knowledge of the correct uh, value of the threshold, we obviously do ASSR. But with Bera, you get an almost approximate value of the threshold. Suppose uh, at 60, after 70 decibel noise, you're not getting any wave. At 60, no wave, 50, no wave, 40, no wave. After 70, it stopped. Or maybe after 80, it stopped. So approximately, you can know that the patient has moderate hearing loss. So this is how you get the approximate idea that it is the threshold. So 10 to 20 decibel lower than the Vera threshold. All right. So 100 decibel, 10 decibel, you're not getting after 110. I mean, 190 decibel noise you are not getting any Vera wave. That means he has profound hearing loss. This is how you check the threshold. Or at 30 decibel, you are getting all the waves. It is almost normal. The threshold, the pure tone threshold will be approximately 20 decibel. But ASSR obviously confirms the threshold. ASSR is mainly for getting the threshold. So that is why before doing cochlear implant, you always do ASSR and Vera, both. So thank you very much, Dr. Sima Monga. We have covered almost all the questions. Thank you very much for the presentation. And thank you very much, Dr. Minima, for joining us. And thank you, Rainis, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Sima. Thank you. Thank you.